Section 1 You will hear a man phoning a woman who lives in an English city called Banford to get some advice about moving to that city. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, Linda speaking. Oh, hi, Linda. This is Matt Brooks. Alex White gave me your number. He said you'd be able to give me some advice about moving to Banford. Yes, Alex did mention you. How can I help? Well, first of all, which area to live in? Well, I live in Dalton, which is a really nice suburb. Not too expensive, and there's a nice park. Sounds good. Do you know how much it would be to rent a two-bedroom flat there? Yeah, you should be able to get something reasonable for £850 per month. That's what people typically pay. You certainly wouldn't want to pay more than £900. That doesn't include bills or anything. No, that sounds all right. I'll definitely have a look there. Are the transport links easy from where you live? Well, I'm very lucky. I work in the city centre, so I don't have to use public transport. I go by bike. Oh, I wish I could do that. Is it safe to cycle around the city? Yes, it's fine. And it keeps me fit. Anyway... Driving to work in the city centre would be a nightmare because there's hardly any parking. And the traffic during the rush hour can be bad. I'd be working from home, but I'd have to go to London one or two days a week. Oh, that's perfect. Getting to London is no problem. There's a fast train every 30 minutes which only takes 45 minutes. That's good. Yeah, the train service isn't bad during the week and they run quite late at night. It's weekends that are a problem. They're always doing engineering work and you have to take a bus to Haddam and pick up the train there, which is really slow. But other than that, Banford's a great place to live. I've never been happier. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. There are some nice restaurants in the city centre and a brand new cinema, which has only been open a couple of months. There's a good art centre too. Sounds like Banford's got it all. Yes, we're really lucky. There are lots of really good aspects to living here. The schools are good, and the hospital here is one of the best in the country. Everyone I know who's been there's had a positive experience. Oh, I can give you the name of my dentist, too, in Bridge Street, if you're interested. 
I've been going to him for years, and I've never had any problems. Oh, OK, thanks. I'll find his number and send it to you. Thanks. That would be really helpful. Are you planning to visit Banford soon? Yes. My wife and I are both coming next week. We want to make some appointments with estate agents. I could meet you if you like and show you around. Are you sure? We'd really appreciate that. Either Tuesday or Thursday is good for me, after 5.30. Thursday's preferable. Tuesday, I need to get home before 6 p.m. OK. Great. Let me know which train you're catching and I'll meet you in the cafe outside. You can't miss it. It's opposite the station and next to the museum. Brilliant. I'll text you next week then. Thanks so much for all the advice. No problem. I'll see you next week. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear Laura talk about this year's International Food Festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, everyone. Today we have a special guest speaker. Laura Lanthor is director of the International Food Festival this year. Laura, can you tell us about what to expect at the festival? Of course, Vincent. This spring, people in the city can go to the 7th Annual International Food Festival. This is a special event for the whole family. I do have to tell you, though, we are holding it at a different date than before. Easter is exceptionally early this year, and if the festival were held as usual, it would have fallen on the same weekend. This year, the festival will be held on the first week of April, before Easter. The festival will be held at the Walker Field grounds and will be divided into four main areas. There will be a Western food area with authentic representations of European cuisine. There will also be an East Asian section with chefs and products from Japan, Korea, and China. A South Asian section will have food from India, Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. For the first time this year, we will also have a Latin American section where people can try things from Mexico, various Caribbean countries, and South America. There will also be special booths where people can learn about all these cuisines. This year, we are expanding the cooking workshop and demonstration portion of the festival. Attendees last year really seemed to like learning about food and having a hands-on experience. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. I'll give you a brief description of three of the workshops we have. Like I said, these allow you to participate directly in the making of food and teach you techniques you can use at home. 
For a full list of them, please go to our online website. We will give you the site address after the end of my talk. You will also find there the procedure to pre-register for the workshops. Pre-registration takes place when you buy your festival tickets and is highly recommended. Non-Western food has become increasingly popular these days and many people are interested in how to cook such food at home. Such cuisines use a variety of different spices, ones that aspiring cooks might not be familiar with. Therefore, our World Tour of Spices is a good introduction to the flavor profiles of other cuisines. I would recommend it for adults who want to seriously learn about cooking. Small children might not take to the more exotic spices. One workshop that is meant for children is Candy Adventures. Their traditional activities like making gingerbread houses. Other activities teach basic decorating techniques including the proper use of coloring dye. Kids can also learn how to make flowers and other objects out of cake frosting. We understand the concerns of parents regarding their children's health, so everything used in this workshop is either sugar-free or uses acceptable sugar substitutes. Lastly, we have a workshop that is suitable for the whole family. Salads Forever is a workshop for everyone interested in healthy eating. There will be different kinds of salads that people can try and demonstrations that show how to make them. Salads have grown in popularity these days and are a healthy addition to any diet if prepared the right way. The workshop will also teach how to make healthy salad dressings. I'm afraid that's all I have today. Please visit the festival website for more details. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3 You will hear a textile design student called Jim discussing his project on using natural dyes for colouring fabrics with his tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. OK, Jim, you wanted to see me about your textile design project. That's right. I've been looking at how a range of natural dyes can be used to colour fabrics like cotton and wool. Why did you choose that topic? Well, I got a lot of useful ideas from the museum, you know, at that exhibition of textiles but I've always been interested in anything to do with colour. Years ago, I went to a carpet shop with my parents when we were on holiday in Turkey, and I remember all the amazing colours. They might not all have been natural dyes. Maybe not, but for the project, I decided to follow it up, and I found a great book about a botanic garden in California that specialises in plants used for dyes. OK, so in your project... You had to include a practical investigation. Yeah. At first, I couldn't decide on my variables. I was going to just look at one type of fibre, for example, like cotton. And see how different types of dyes affected it? Yes. Then I decided to include others as well. So I looked at cotton and wool and nylon. With just one type of dye? Various types, including some that weren't natural, for comparison. OK. So, I did the experiments last week. I used some ready-made natural dyes. I found a website which supplied them. They came in just a few days, but I also made some of my own. That must have taken quite a bit of time. Yes. 
I thought it'd just be a matter of a teaspoon or so of dye. And actually, that wasn't the case at all. Like, I was using one vegetable, a beetroot, for a red dye, and I had to chop up a whole pile of it. So it all took longer than I'd expected. One possibility is to use food colourings. I did use one. That was a yellow dye, an artificial one. Tatrazine? Yeah. I used it on cotton first. It came out a great colour. But when I rinsed the material, the colour just washed away. I'd been going to try it out on nylon, but I abandoned that idea. Were you worried about health issues? I thought if it's a legal food colouring, it must be safe. Well, it can occasionally cause allergic reactions, I believe. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So what natural dyes did you look at? Well, one was turmeric. The colour's great. It's a really strong yellow. It's generally used in dishes like curry. It's meant to be quite good for your health when eaten, but you might find it's not permanent when it's used as a dye. A few washes and it's gone. Right. I used beetroot as a dye for wool. When I chop up beetroot to eat, I always end up with bright red hands. But the wool ended up just a sort of watery cream shade. Disappointing. There's a natural dye called Tyrian purple. Have you heard of that? Yes. It comes from a shellfish, and it was worn in ancient times, but only by important people, as it was so rare. I didn't use it. It fell out of use centuries ago, though one researcher managed to get hold of some recently. But that shade of purple can be produced by chemical dyes nowadays. Did you use any black dyes? Logwood. That was quite complicated. I had to prepare the fabric so the dye would take. I hope you were careful to wear gloves. Yes, I know the danger with that dye. Good, it can be extremely dangerous if it's ingested. Now, presumably you had a look at an insect-based dye, like cochineal, for example. Yes, I didn't actually make that. I didn't have time to start crushing up insects to get the red colour. And anyway, they're not available here. But I managed to get the dye quite easily from a website. But it cost a fortune. I can see why it's generally just used in cooking and in small quantities. Yes, it's very effective, but that's precisely why it's not used as a dye. I also read about using metal oxide. Apparently, you can allow iron to rust while it's in contact with the fabric, and that colours it. Yes, that works well for dyeing cotton. But you have to be careful as the metal can actually affect the fabric and so you can't expect to get a lot of wear out of fabrics treated in this way. And the colours are quite subtle. Not everyone likes them. Anyway, it looks as if you've done a lot of work. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on a type of fundraising for business, called crowdfunding. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 32. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 32.
Good morning, everyone. Today we're continuing our look at funding opportunities for small startup businesses. The emergence of social media has given companies the ability to connect with fans and potential customers directly. On the back of the growth in social media, a model of raising finance has emerged known as crowdfunding. This revolutionary way of raising finance began with micro lending in the 90s. More recently, an equity-based model has emerged that allows people to invest directly in a new company. We're going to examine this in more detail later, but let's turn first to a third model, which I'll term a fan-based model. With this model of crowdfunding, individuals are encouraged to give an amount of money to support the launch of a project or initiative without the promise of any financial return. Instead, there's a reward for donating. This contrasts with the micro-lending model, which would require a return on investment, and the equity-based scheme, which may offer shares. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 33 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 33 to 40. Crowdfunding portals or websites allow the business concerned to present the initiative along with the financial target required. There's a fixed time limit for fundraising and if the target amount is reached, all donations are paid to the company or individual. Whether it's an author planning to write a new book an independent film company looking to make a new film, or a technology company with an idea for an app, the person or company needing funding would turn to its fan base for support. This is managed through one of the many crowdfunding online portals that have emerged. Of course, a fan or supporter of a particular initiative is likely to give money anyway. But donation-based crowdfunding will often make donating even more attractive by offering a rewards-based incentive scheme. Let's take a film company, for example, that needs funding for a new film. For a small, set donation, the donor might be offered a free ticket to the premiere or a DVD of the film. A larger set donation might be rewarded by the chance to attend a launch event when the film goes live. Those people who make bigger donations could even be offered the chance to meet the cast of the film whilst the highest level donation could see the person's name mentioned in the film credits. For companies that already have a significant fan base, crowdfunding offers a fantastic opportunity to raise money quickly from a large number of people, each of whom donates just a small amount of money. Compare this to the time and effort that would be needed to sell your idea to investors or your bank manager, particularly in an age when raising finance can be difficult. The company may also have links with partner companies or organisations that run fundraising events. In this case, you can significantly increase participation by working with these organisations to promote your crowdfunding project. Another significant advantage is that you can reach out to your fan base for feedback on the project while it's being developed thus making the final product more appealing. Crowdfunding enables you to raise awareness of the product at an early stage, thus increasing the potential for sales. With so many people behind you, it can also act as a great incentive to get the best possible product out on time and on budget. However, there are disadvantages to bear in mind. The model can be described as all or nothing. If you don't reach the monetary target required in the agreed time, all promises of donations are cancelled and no money is paid, leaving you back at square one. Should this happen, or still worse, you receive the funding but are unable to come up with the product, not only will your fans end up disappointed, but the portal will record the fact that you failed to reach your target or that the initiative failed. 
fulfilling all the pledges that you've made to people can also be very time-consuming. For example, remembering to send out copies of books or free cinema tickets can sometimes be forgotten in the excitement and frenzy of launching your product. People sometimes forget to factor in the cost of rewards when calculating profit margins. But these can be significant. And finally, if you have a small fan base, for example, you're a new company or have a small social media footprint, raising awareness of your initiative will be challenging. These drawbacks aside, donation-based crowdfunding is a wonderful opportunity for individuals or small startups to raise funds for that exciting new project whilst reaching out and connecting to the people who are most likely to support and promote your work for you. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.